John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah glory, Welcome glory, to hallelujah. War of the Rebellion Stories of the Civil War and our reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. Let's get right into it. In the Enemy's Lines After Chancellorsville, by Robert P. Douglas. Private. Company E. The writer's experience after the Battle of Chancellorsville was a most unusual one. About the time the Fifth Corps crossed the Rappahannock at Kelly's Ford, Jacob Landsberger of Company F and the writer were detailed by order of our regimental surgeon, Dr. Reed, acting surgeon in charge of the Second Division Fifth Corps Field Hospital for duty at that hospital. We were considered very fortunate in getting this detail, as we were relieved of our arms and the burden of our knapsacks, which were thrown into the ambulances and not seen again. Landsberger and the rider, after reporting, remained on duty with the Division Hospital Corps until the night of May 5th, when we were left, with other Union soldiers, to guard some of the wounded of both armies in an old sawmill on the road from Chancellorsville to the United States Ford. The Corps had been withdrawn across the Rappahannock, and we knew we were then outside our lines. In this field hospital, thus abandoned, there was a wounded Confederate captain, two lieutenants, and twenty or more of their enlisted men, also wounded, and a few of our own wounded, unable to move. Orders came from headquarters of the Fifth Corps to allow none of the enemy's wounded to overhear or to obtain any news from us of Hooker's retreat. All that night we heard the retreating columns of our army marching back to the Rappahannock. We would have been only too glad to have gone along, but our strict orders were to remain at our posts, and as good soldiers we remained in obedience to those orders. The little squad of abandoned guards, thus left at the sawmill, were in for developments, which soon came. At one o'clock on the morning of the 6th of May, Dr. Reed, surgeon in charge of the United States forces, sent an orderly to the guards and nurses just before the retreat, with orders to destroy all medical stores, to cut the leather medicine bags, and to break up all the medicine chests, to prevent them from falling into the enemy's hands. These stores would have been a great boon to them at any time, and especially at this time when they had thousands of their wounded requiring attention. We carried out our orders to the letter. When our wounded were taken within our lines, after a delay of two weeks following the retreat of Hooker's army, a flag of truce arrangement was made by Generals Hooker and Lee, by which all the Union wounded, aggregating several thousand left within the Confederate lines, should be paroled and moved to Hooker's Hospital on the north side of the Rappahannock, near the United States Ford. The guards and nurses naturally expected to go back with them, but in this they were sorely disappointed. When the 5th Corps ambulance trains under a flag of truce came out, Corporal John M. Lancaster of Company E was in charge of the detail. Dr. Reed, a regimental surgeon, a non-combatant, under orders withdrew with this detail. Several trips were made by the ambulance trains of the 5th Corps from the north side of the Rappahannock by way of the United States Ford. The distance was about five miles and required time and care to transport so many sufferers back within the Union lines. There were about one hundred of our men originally detailed in all the squads, besides ourselves, many from the 62nd Pennsylvania, the 140th New York, and some of the 63rd Pennsylvania of the 3rd Corps. Their duties, being the same as Landsberger's and the writer's, viz., to nurse and care for our wounded. 
These nurses were subsequently not permitted by the Confederates under the terms of the flag of truce to return to their regiments after the removal of our wounded, except those who were not fit to be removed. The Confederates had taken charge of their own wounded at the Sawmill Hospital and elsewhere the day following Hooker's retreat. All the Union details of nurses and guards immediately after the retreat of our army were made prisoners of war. Introduction to the Enemy The first knowledge of and introduction to the enemy occurred on the 6th of May, about 8 o'clock in the morning. We saw some cavalry approaching wearing the Union uniform. The writer remarked to Comrade Landsberger, quote, We are all right yet. Here comes our cavalry. Unquote. A cavalryman rode up to us and drawing a huge navy revolver with great bravado and many foul oaths, boisterously threatened to shoot us. None of the Union soldiers in the details of guards and nurses was armed. So we being in the same condition, could offer no resistance. We expostulated with our captor, showing him we were unarmed, being non-combatants on detail in charge of Confederate wounded as well as of our own. That had not been able to be removed under a flag of truce, regularly agreed on by the commanders of both armies. It was a very exciting experience, and nerve-wracking in the extreme to look into the chambers of a huge colt which our bloodthirsty captor held so close to the rider's head that he could plainly see the bullets in the cylinder. When the remainder of the Confederate scouts came up, we were declared prisoners by the commanding officer, and at once marched to the rear of Lee's army, where the officer in whose charge we were given immediately placed us in a Confederate hospital to take care of many wounded Union prisoners. On our march from the sawmill to the rear, we passed over the battlefield, and our little party saw many horrible scenes. Many of the dead of both armies lay unburied where they fell, with their clothing burned from their bodies by the fire which swept over the field after the battle on Sunday afternoon, May 3rd. Around the trees where there were patches of grass, Many wounded of both armies had crawled and died. The writer noticed that the trousers of many of these dead soldiers had been burned to the knees, and that the woolen material had not burned further than where the bodies had been lying among the dried leaves. The fresh grass would not ignite, and the fire in the clothing had gone out. The dried leaves and brush had been set on fire by the explosive shells used by each army, all such wood fires spread rapidly, and many wounded and dying had met a horrible end. These gruesome and terrible sights convey an apt illustration of General Sherman's celebrated epigram, quote, War is hell, unquote. The writer noticed particularly an oak tree that had been hit three times during the battle by cannonballs from the Union artillery, each shot cutting off a section of the tree, and it had been literally cut down at the stump by bullets. This stump was not far from where General Jackson was killed. On this same march, as prisoners, we passed an old tobacco house where there were still many of our wounded, mostly belonging to Howard's 11th Corps. There the rider gave away the last cracker he had to a wounded Union soldier, suffering the pangs of hunger and pain. The condition of all the wounded in this hospital was terrible in the extreme. Outside of the tobacco shed lay five dead Union soldiers, stripped of every stitch of their clothing. These horrors were all observed on the 11th Corps line. These five dead bodies were utterly neglected and unburied three days. The writer gave them a decent burial. After a halt here by our little band of prisoners, for ten days we were marched to a point near Gordonsville, Virginia, and were halted at a farmhouse in which there were about seventy-five Union wounded in the recent battle, who were, of course, prisoners. With a comrade of the 62nd Pennsylvania, the rider was left by the officer in charge of the prisoners to care for these wounded. There was no lint and no medicines of any kind on hand, 
and nothing of which we could make bandages. Many of these suffering ones were even in worse condition than those at the tobacco house we had just left. In a word, it was frightful. Many, thus neglected, died of blood poisoning. We cleaned the sores of those still alive by using plenty of cold water, going from one sufferer to another day and night. This was long before the day of antiseptic surgery, but it was there, the best and only treatment possible. Jackson's Old Corps, now commanded by General Jeb Stuart, was encamped close by, and one day, while off duty, the writer took a stroll through their camps. While watching the Confederate bakers making bread, one of their soldiers said, quote, Yank, aren't you afraid to be here, sir, by yourself? To which the writer replied, No, sir, I am unarmed and a prisoner in charge of our wounded. Yes, sir, he replied, but you might be taken for a spy, unquote. Realizing at once the risks of being taken, the writer began to move off for the hospital, when the same man said, quote, Yank, you see those boys over there? Those uns are North Carolina troops. They didn't want to fight for the South, sir, but we placed them in the front, sir, at Chancellorsville, and they had to fight, unquote. A few days after this conversation, one of these same North Carolina soldiers came to the hospital of the Union prisoners and begged the guards to arrange for him to be sent through the Confederate lines with the Union wounded, which was expected to be ordered at any time. He declared he was tired fighting and had enough of it. This man came every day to the hospital for nearly a week. One of the Union wounded, a Burdan sharpshooter, died. The North Carolina visitor was told that if he could help bury the body, we would let him have the deceased's uniform, and he could take his name, and in that manner get through the lines with the convalescent Union wounded. He donned the Union uniform, and worked with us in the hospital for another week before the Union wounded and their guards were to start for exchange and parole at Annapolis, Maryland. When the day came... The entire party was marched to the United States Ford on the Rappahannock River, under escort of a squad of Confederate cavalry, where the North Carolina Johnny metamorphosed into a Burdan sharpshooter of the Union Army, stood right at my left when the Union wounded crossed. Captain Kidd Douglas, Adjutant General of Jackson's Corps, recorded the names of the party and gave out the paroles both to the returning guard and the nurses. The North Carolina deserter passed without detection and crossed with the wounded, and we never saw him again. My comrade of the 62nd Pennsylvania and myself were very glad when our North Carolina friend passed safely through into our lines. We greatly feared that he might prove traitor and inform the Confederate officer in charge of our party of our connivance in his escape, in which event, our lives would not have been greatly prolonged. The wounded turned over to the Union Army here were the last of the prisoners captured at Chancellorsville, all of whom were wounded, numbering about 5,000 and upwards in that battle. The detachment of guards and nurses and prisoners were treated as a distinct body separate and aside from the wounded. The Confederates at the United States Ford, when the exchange was made, seemed to have doubts as to the military status of our party, and of our right to be treated as non-combatants under the flag of truce, which the Confederates evidently construed as applying only to the wounded prisoners. We were much surprised, and disappointed, therefore, after all the wounded were transferred within the Union lines, when we were informed that our little party were still prisoners of war. We were marched to Richmond, and put in Libby Prison, where we remained four days without rations. In the meantime, our status having been settled by the Confederates, we were, on the fourth day, taken out of Libby, and marched again to United States Ford, a distance, I suppose, of about fifty miles. This was close to where we had been made prisoners, and we had been able to see something of the country between there and the Confederate capital. 
This time, to our very great joy, we were passed through the lines at the ford without delay. We were now paroled prisoners, and our next destination was Camp Parole at Annapolis, where we were to remain until formally exchanged. This was another surprise to us. This was about the middle of June. Three of our party, all from Pittsburgh, decided to take, quote, French leave, unquote, and go home, and we were not long in starting. The three of us remained at home for six weeks. The writer, weary of the monotony of this kind of military life, went on duty with the provost guard, being prevented from service with his company at the front until duly exchanged. Comrade Landsberger, the writer's fellow nurse on this detail, on being exchanged some time afterward, returned to the regiment, and remained on duty with his company until badly wounded in the first day's battle in the wilderness. At Gettysburg, Under Front and Rear Fire By Corporal Henry F. Weaver, Company B Weed's Brigade, Sykes Division, 5th Corps, and the 155th Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers arrived on the field at Gettysburg early on the morning of July 2nd, somewhere near Culp's Hill, on the right of the Union Line. Except to shift from one position to another, we did nothing for several hours. The order announcing that General George G. Meade had taken charge of the Army of the Potomac was read to the troops while in line of battle in the woods, with skirmishers thrown out. While I do not think that any more impressive or patriotic order could be read to any troops on the eve of battle and the assumption of command by a new general, I confess that I was disappointed when the order was signed, George G. Meade, and not George B. McClellan, but Providence directed otherwise. We remained in this position for some time, the men making coffee, many of them bathing in the creek, so the hours passed pleasantly away. The command had rested and taken short naps at halts. It was ominously quiet along our front, the quietness being broken only by some desultory infantry and artillery firing, doubtless both armies being occupied in getting ready to renew the contest. About 4 p.m., the report of a solitary cannon was heard away over to the left. It was from Sickles, and the Battle of the 2nd of July had commenced. This single cannon firing was followed by more, and then one, two, somewhat broken. Then came the final crash and roar of musketry and booming of artillery together. Sykes' Fifth Corps was then ordered to Little Round Top, following no roadway, tearing down fences. The men double-quicked out past Little Round Top, near where two brigades of regulars of Ayr's division were already engaged. Weed's brigade halted behind a battery actively engaged. The 155th men loaded muskets, and then by orders countermarched, left in front, and took position on Little Round Top. The 155th of Weed's brigade was on the right of the line and Company B on the right of the regiment. A good view of that portion of the field, when not obscured by the smoke of battle, was afforded. The two small brigades of United States regulars of Ayr's division had advanced beyond the position of the 155th on Little Round Top, toward the wheat field. This movement being made by the United States regulars to support General Sickles. The regulars fought with determined skill and bravery for nearly an hour, and then reluctantly fell back as if on drill but sharply, and bravely contesting every foot of the ground. These things I saw, and I am glad, as a volunteer, to bear tribute to the United States regulars. The remaining portion of the Third Corps and regulars were overwhelmed, and fell back to Little Round Top. There were two batteries of artillery, one of steel and the other of brass pieces, one in front and one over to the right of the regiment, which kept up their fire until the very last, two of the steel guns being captured, and one of them recaptured later from the enemy. In the meantime, the regulars reformed in line of battle a little below the position of the 155th 
on the crest of Little Round Top, and the fire in our immediate front slackened temporarily. The enemy appeared and advanced from the Devil's Den, and to the left of it, owing to the formation of the ground, struck the left of the line of Wheat's brigade at its extended concave portion, and the fight became terrific. Just then, Robertson's brigade of Texans swung across the foot of the hill and advanced to attack the positions occupied by the 140th and 146th New York and the 91st and 155th Pennsylvania Volunteers. I wondered why our battery immediately above us did not open fire. Five minutes pass away. What is the matter? Then the battery opened and over our head went a screaming, whistling shell, followed by another, and another, and so on. Still the enemy kept on advancing on the positions of the four regiments mentioned, which formed Wheat's brigade. Impatiently, waiting as we were, it was hard to repress our fire. At last the order came to us. Steady. Ready. Aim. Fire! We arose and delivered our fire at close buck and ball range of our muskets, and reloaded and fired again. But still the Confederates kept advancing, halting to fire volleys as they advanced. The Confederates were brave, resolute, and determined men. At this time I was wounded in the ball of the right ankle joint. I felt a stinging sensation extending to the thigh, but no pain. The enemy's bullets kept coming as numerous apparently as the drops of rain in a heavy storm. As I lay there, wounded, I expected to get a bullet in my head at any moment, but fortunately did not. Looking in front of my position, I say Corporal David M. Smith of our company, lying mortally wounded behind a shelving rock about five years from my position, the ball must have severed the femoral artery. He turned to me and said, quote, Oh, I am shot. Unquote. The stretcher bearers carried him back a short time after, but he died just as they reached the foot of the hill. While I was trying all in my power to encourage Corporal Smith, a bullet struck Comrade William Douglas of my company, fairly in the center of the forehead, and with a terrible shriek, he fell back dead. I shall never forget the sight. In the light of, after discovered evidence, a charge, which Major A. L. Pearson sought permission to make at that time and was refused, would have been wrong. Weed's brigade, having been assigned in order to hold that position of Little Round Top only, General Meade wisely provided other troops for that purpose and ordered them to do the charging. Lieutenant Luke J. Dooling of Company I, seeing that I was wounded and unable to stand, the pain having become excruciating, ran up to me exclaiming, quote, Poor boy, are you hurt? Are you wounded? Unquote. I threw my arms round his and Comrade Pat Lyon's necks, and was thus taken back some distance until we met some stretcher bearers from the Sixth Corps, who carried me a short distance to the rear at the foot of Little Round Top. Passing what was evidently a brigade of the Sixth Corps being formed in line of battle, one behind the other in perfect formation, which did me good to see, as the musketry fire at the front occupied by Weed's brigade was still severe, and the battle by no means decided. General Meade's provision for the reserve line of the battle was perfect. Shells and balls from the enemy were coming through the trees and knocking off branches here and there, during the passage of the wounded to the rear. We also passed two members of our company bearing the body of Corporal Smith, who had just died from his wounds. I was next placed in an ambulance, which, after receiving other wounded soldiers, not of our regiment, started back along the Tawny Town Road and we were deposited on the ground near Meade's headquarters, on the left center of the Union lines, where we lay all night. Some time later, the Union batteries on the ridge in front of where the wounded were placed opened on the enemy. I never could understand this, as our yellow hospital flags were flying and plainly visible from the small buildings, why our artillerists at that time should draw the enemy's fire at a point where their answering missiles 
would fall among the already wounded men seemed incomprehensible. The enemy at once responded, and their fire became so warm as to compel the removal of the wounded, who were taken in ambulances to our right and laid under trees and woods. Escaping from the fire of the enemy in this position, the wounded were not so fortunate otherwise. As during the night, one terrific thunderstorm after another broke out over our heads, followed by vivid flashes of lightning, continuing through the night. I pulled my gum blanket over my head, and wrapped it around my body the best I could, and was thus afforded some protection from the rain. Early in the morning, I was carried and laid on the ground a short distance from the field hospital operating table. The rain still continuing, I made a pillow of my haversack, and again pulling my gum blanket over my face, lay there as patiently as I could, waiting my turn to be operated on. During a lull in the battle, Pat Lyon and Isaac Craig of our company hunted me up, and Pat, taking his blanket from his shoulder, threw it over me, as I, being well drenched, was shivering with cold. A period of several hours followed, during which we heard but little firing at the front. Suddenly, the artillery fire from a hundred guns opened and the din was terrific evidently being the initial attack on our side to repel Pickett's charge. During all this noise and confusion, I was removed and placed on the operating table, and had my foot amputated by Dr. Reed, regimental surgeon of the 155th, assisted by the surgeon of the 91st Pennsylvania Volunteers. As they were about to administer the chloroform to me, I heard Dr. Billings, a regular army surgeon, say, quote, let us be as quick as we can, as some of us may be killed during the operation. Unquote. The shells and stray balls from the Confederates at that time were whistling through the location of the field hospital, and the limbs of the trees were falling in every direction. There did not seem to be safety at any place in this trying period of the battle. After the operation had been performed in this exposed field hospital in the immediate rear of Little Round Top, and the shelling and noise had subsided at the front, I was lifted from the operating table, still in a semi-conscious state. I was again laid on the ground which had been covered with straw taken by eminent domain from neighboring barns. Soon after, small tents were erected, and all the wounded were placed in them as fast as they were put up, so as to guard against drenching rains. Color Corporals Thomas J. Tomer of Company E and John H. Mackin of Company F who also had been wounded while with the colors, about the same time I was wounded, secured quarters in one of these tents. Privates Charles F. McKenna of Company E and Samuel W. Hill of Company F, as soon as the firing in front ceased, were allowed to leave the ranks to visit Corporals Tomer, Mackin, myself, and other companions in a field hospital in rear of Little Round Top, and their visits cheered us very much. From the tents the wounded could see most gruesome sights, amputations of arms and legs by the army surgeons to save the lives of the wounded ran up into thousands, and for want of assistance these dissevered members, the first few days, were suffered to accumulate in piles several feet in height. The bodies of the poor comrades not surviving these operations, and the hundreds of dead from wounds or blood poisoning were placed in the dead house close by to await burial. These harrowing environments were not conductive towards cheering or comforting the suffering wounded. Night, letting her sable mantle down, shut from view the terrible scenes of human wrath. Everything quieted down, and we slept fitfully until the next morning, the 4th of July. Late in the day, the surgeon in charge came in and, greeting the wounded, said, quote, well, while you were all in pretty bad shape, you seem to be in good spirits, and I have good news for you. This battle is won. The rebels are retreating. Vicksburg has also fallen. And so this is a good and glorious Fourth of July, after all. Don't you think so? Unquote. It is needless to say. We answered him with an affirmative shout. 
and we will pick up the Kiskaminas squad by its only survivor, Private J. King Atler, next week. So, let's sit down and talk about some crazy notes. In the Enemy's Lines by Private Douglas of Company E, this guy has a unique experience if I've ever read one. Can you imagine thinking that you've got a sweet, easy gig in the rear, you're not having to go fight in the battle, only to find yourself in Libby prison just a little bit, just a little bit later. And after having to take care of and deal with all of the wounded and the suffering, man, if that's not the stuff of nightmares, I'm not sure what is. And also having a revolver pointed at your head and keeping cool. Goodness gracious. What a champ though, right? Of course, him having to travel back across the Chancellorsville battlefield and see the destruction afterwards must have been pretty ghastly. No way this dude doesn't have nightmares afterwards. And also, this is the first account that I've read that takes place from a battle's perspective of that of a soldier nurse and one that gets captured, and him giving those soldiers who were stripped naked burials. I'm telling you, my comrade here is a true American soldier. Now, that experience aside, him encountering the Confederate soldier, <laughs> who was literally like, do you want to get hanged for a spy? What are you even doing here? <laughs> and I just... And also... Why those North Carolina soldiers didn't want to fight? Maybe Northern aligned conscripts, maybe, or maybe just conscripts. I think back to some of kind of like the Americans throughout the South that valiantly fought against the Confederacy from within sabotaging supply lines, killing commissary officers and tax collectors, just generally being like good old American hellraisers. I feel like this is the opposite of that. When you take those kind of guys and they get stuck, conscripted into the army, and they're forced to fight, which is, explains why so many of them left as soon as they could. And what do you think about that Confederate soldier who snuck out of the rebel army? Do you think he was a spy, or was he serious? I'd like to think he really did have enough of the fighting and quit. Best of luck to him, I guess. All right. On to At Gettysburg by Corporal Weaver of Company B. What a story this guy has. He has more packed into this day than some people have in their lives, I bet. My goodness. I like the honesty, though. Him wanting a McClellan rather than Meade. I get it. And this is a pretty good account of the battle at Little Round Top. And Buck and Ball? That's rough for rebels. Coming up against, climbing up that steep slope, with guys shooting Buck and Ball at you in massed volleys? No, thank you. And... On top of that, the U.S. regulars must have been some hardcore dudes because they keep getting shout-outs, don't they? Everyone's like, yeah, U.S. regulars, they were some hardcore dudes, but you had to be there to see it. Uh, so, take a sip on your favorite drink and let's drink the him today, whatever it might be. This guy did a lot for us. And I keep thinking about Union soldiers like him. And how they literally built the country we have today. right? The founding fathers founded the nation. But our modern nation was built and born by these guys. So, the next time you're at Gettysburg, go behind a little round top. And back there somewhere is where he had his foot cut off. And just take a moment. You lost your foot for us. Right here. <laughs> um... I know I'm going to be, I'm still very excited to be able to get to go to Gettysburg. When I do go, I will take all of you with me. I'll film the entire thing. 
And we'll hit up all of these places that they talk about. But, you know, right now, I've got so many issues with my house. <laughs> Nobody told me that houses are basically always falling apart. Which makes me feel even more sorry for boat owners, because that's got to be even more rough. But, oh. Anyway, at least I know that <laughs> anytime I think about surgery, I'm going to be thinking of this guy. Because it doesn't matter what that surgery's for. At least my doctors don't have cannonballs being shot at them. <laughs> Whoops. And then being put to sleep right afterwards. Oh, could you imagine? Terrifying. Anyway, my friends, if you want to look at some more content, by all means, go to rebellionstories.com, my website. That'll take you to the YouTube channel, to the Patreon, to, uh, to everything. It's all there. It's all linked together. So, uh, I will see you in the next episode. And of course, I will always plug my own merch. If you would like a very cool War of the Rebellion t-shirt, mug, or sweatshirt, those are also on sale at their normal price. Uh, I haven't actually figured out how to put them on sale. I think I just changed the price. But you didn't hear that. I'm mysterious and I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, all right. Um, maybe I'll do that this weekend. I have uh, a bunch of my merchandise that I had sent to me that I've been wearing around. And it's been pretty effective. People ask me, they're like, hey, what is that sweatshirt? I'm like, yeah, let me tell you about it. So uh, maybe that's something I'll do this weekend. I'll post all the merch with me wearing it so you guys can see what it looks like. It's pretty cool. Some people have already bought some. Uh, and it's it's good quality. I was really surprised. I was prepared to be sad. And I'm not sad. So, all right, friends. I will talk to you later. Have a great one. And take care of yourselves this weekend. Bye-bye. Old John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave While weep the sons of bondage whom he ventured all to save But though he sleeps his life was lost while struggling for the slave His soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Hallelujah, for his soul is marching on. John Brown was a hero, undaunted, true, and brave. And Kansas knew his valor when he fought her rights to save. And now, though the grass grows green above his grave, his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. He captured Harper's Ferry with his 19 men so few And frightened old Virginia till she trembled through and through they hung him for a traitor, themselves a traitorous crew, but a soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. For a soul is marching on.
John Brown was John the Baptist of the Christ we are to see. Christ who of the bondman shall the liberator be. And soon throughout the sunny south the slaves shall all be free. For his soul is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. That he heralded, he looked from heaven to view On the army of the Union With its flag red, white, and blue And heaven shall sing with anthems Or the deed they mean to do For his soul is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Then strike while strike ye may The death blow of oppression In a better time and way The dawn of old John Brown Has brightened in the day And his soul is marching on 